Good evening. I'm Nadia Sheikh. I'm the Vice Provost for Cultural and Research Engagement here at NYU Abu Dhabi. I welcome you to the uh, Institute this evening to listen to Dr. Najat Saliba's lecture entitled, No Choice But to Keep Creating Futures, The Frontier of Climate Change. As some of you know, the UN Climate Change Conference will take place in Abu Dhabi in November 2023. As the UAE prepares uh, to host leaders and negotiators from around 200 countries, NYU Abu Dhabi is keen to participate in this effort by dedicating the academic year 2023-2024, so next academic year, to environmental issues and sustainability and climate change, of course. So we are thrilled that um, the program the, uh, of Arab Crossroads Studies um, invited uh, uh, Dr. Saliba to, to, uh, to give this lecture as, in a way, preamble and prelude to uh, next year's activities. Dr. Saliba is professor of chemistry. She was the former director of the Nature Conservation Center at the American University of Beirut. In her research, she uh, developed innovative methods to determine the physical and chemical characteristics of water pipe smoke and electronic nicotine delivery systems at the design and smoke levels. She also determined the major contributing sources of elevated levels of pollution in Beirut and assessed the contribution of dust storms originating in nearby deserts. The data she generated is used by local government and research agencies. Sorry. Um, the World Health Organization, WHO, and the World Bank in their publications. Dr. Saliba, moreover, leads in offering innovative solutions to local, rural, environmental challenges to public participatory and citizen science approach. Her recent work has focused on waste management and water contamination. For her research, Dr. Saliba received the 2019 L'Oréal UNESCO International Award for Women in Science and the National Order of the Cedar from the President of the Lebanese Republic. She was appointed member of the International Board of the Science Programs at UNESCO and is chair of one of the expert working groups at WHO Global Air Pollution and Health. She was moreover voted among the BBC 100 women in 2019. In 2020, following the horrendous explosion at the port of Beirut on August 4, Dr. Saliba co-founded Khadit Beirut, a grassroots initiative which strives to go build local alternatives, best practices, and growth opportunities driven by local needs, accountable to people, and focused on sustainable solutions in the areas of community health, education, environmental health, and local business. This last summer, Dr. Saliba also managed to win a seat in the Lebanese parliament. Uh, so She's coming now. Uh, we invited her before she became a member of parliament, but now she is a member of parliament, of the Lebanese parliament. Thank you, Dr. Saliba, for being with us. The floor is yours. The eyeglasses are here. Good evening, everyone. It gives me a great pleasure to be with you tonight. And I'm going to talk about climate change globally. And also, I want to talk about the initiatives that we're doing at the local level for combating climate change and how these initiatives at the local level can be taken up to the global importance. So. My tit the title of my talk today is No Choice But to Keep Creating Futures. I don't think we have other choices. And mainly about the frontiers of climate change. What I will talk about in the early, in the beginning of this, of this presentation, I'll talk about climate change and how we're creating futures. And then I leave the choices till the end. So this is a snapshot of a movie that showed 
how the temperature of the Earth changed from, 19, from 1887 all the way to 2019. And we can see a variation of around 4 degrees C, which means that the Earth is getting hotter and hotter everywhere. That's very alarming. This is also ensuring or assuring that the climate change is here and we are all going to be affected by it. And business as usual is no longer valid. So what can education do? If research has solved many problems or many challenges in the past, will it be able to solve the climate change problem? And if so, will education need to continue the way it is? Or should we change education as well so that we rise up to the challenges? Education alone, of course, cannot solve the problem. So what are the other sectors that need to come into play? And, sorry, and the last thing is the question, the big question that we will all be able to answer at the end of this talk. Can we really reverse the climate, the climate change problem? Before I continue my talk, I would like to stop to define some of the words that, or the narrative, the rhetoric that a lot of people are using to talk about climate change or to address climate change. We talk a lot about raising awareness, but raising awareness, in my opinion, is a very static thing because it seeks to inform and educate and not more than that. Capacity building, on the other hand, it asks for a process of developing something. Still, I don't think capacity building alone has done enough to combat climate change. We also talk about mitigation, the act of reducing the severity of, an, of, a, of a process. We talk about adaptation, and this I have a problem with. Because adaptation is the process of change by which we accommodate what's happening. And so when, it, when we talk about adaptation as if we're accepting climate change and we want to see how we have to change to live with climate change, that's a problem. I like the word transformation because transformation is asking for a change in order for us to take action and start really helping each other in order for us to solve this problem. So raising awareness has done a good job because people love nature. Now the youth, the young generation, is more avid to talk about nature than the previous generations. And people, when they travel, they seek wild areas. They want to explore and they want to do action in nature. And that's why the World Travel and Tourism Report has shown in 2018 that this sector has over 319 million jobs. Also, travelers have spent more than $233 billion in 2019 alone. What happened in 2020? The world came to a stop because of coronavirus, of course. And not only that, climate change became more prominent than, than ever before. Why? Because we saw lots of wildfires. We all remember the Siberia fire and the California fire that happened in 2021. In addition, we saw lots of floods and over 920 people were killed in floods and landslides in July 2021. Closer to home and in this area, we saw major dust outbreaks in Africa, Middle East, and China. What do we mean by dust outbreaks? They, it's true that they come from the desert, but they are strongly related to climate change. Their primary driver is dry conditions and they are associated with many meteorological factors to drive sands out of the place they live in, in order for them to reach 
urban areas. When sandstorms happen, they cover a huge area, like the sandstorm that happened in China in 2021, where schools were forced to close, flights were forced to cancel, and the concentration of PM10, which is particulate matters floating in the air of 10 micrometer in diameter or less, reached up to 8,000 microgram per meter cubed. Also, the PM2.5 was 200 microgram per meter cubed in the air, and this is far beyond what WHO recommends. Okay, meaning that when sandstorms happen, they affect the air quality. They are instigators of air pollution. When we talk about PM2.5 reaching 200 microgram per meter cubed, that means climate change is a condition or is a factor that will increase air pollution. So climate change and air pollution are interrelated. What does it mean in terms of risk? When we talk about the coronavirus that forced the whole world to stop, the toll on the death of coronavirus up to date, up to two days ago, was 6.54 million since 2019. How many people die from air pollution every year? We have 10 million. Yet, the world doesn't talk about air pollution, but they talk a lot about coronavirus. Why? Because we want to continue business as usual. And that's a problem. What is the air pollution in the world? When we talk about air pollution, we talk about the levels of particulate matter 2.5 micrometer in diameter. Why? Because there has been established a causal effect between the level of particulate matter and the death rate or the morbidity rate as well. If you can see, the levels of PM2.5 are really high in our area, in our region, much higher than other regions. This is not only because of anthropogenic activities. It's also because we live in a place where the largest deserts area exists. The Arabian Desert, the African Desert, and the China, Mongolia, and Gobi Deserts. So that's why our problem to mitigate air pollution is very challenging here. At the local level, the sandstorms are natural phenomena, but they are exacerbated when there is drought. They increased dramatically in recent year to, due to desertification, of course. And when they travel from the origin, from the desert, all the way to cities, they pick up lots of local pollutants. So their effect on health become different. Yet, those particulates that start here in the region or next to a desert place, they don't stay in one place. They travel long distances. So their effect is not local, their effect is global. So that's why it's extremely important to combat this drought, not only for in one country, but it has to be a global effort. Definitely, sandstorms are directly affecting SDG 11 and 17. This is to explain in very little chemistry how deserts or, or desert, uh, desert particles, if you can see, oh, I didn't bring my, okay, here. If you can see here, the compositions of the particle is mainly mineral dust when it originates from the desert. As it travels, the levels of mineral dust decrease and the levels of local pollutants increase. And this has been going, I mean, the discussion about the effect of these dust particles on health 
has been the subject of discussion in many meetings at the WHO because we want to show how bad desert dust is and whether or not it should follow the same regulations as local pollutants. Okay, and this is uh, ongoing and we hope to have a good answer relying of course on many uh, reviews and scientific paper by the end of next year. We're still working on this with WHO. Great. So we talked about the particles in the air, but we also have to talk about gases in the air. Gases other than CO2, of course, when we talk about NO2, NO2 is not a biogenic. So NO2 is mainly coming from industrial and combustion activities. It's very interesting to show. So we talked about the desert storms and they're mainly in the region, in the Gulf region. When we talk about NO2, it's here and here. In these places, we have more instability in the country and we have high emissions of combustible sources. Why? Because we have unregulated cars, because NO2 is a main emitter, main, mainly emitted from cars. And unfortunately, we also have local power plants, mainly diesel generators. And this, is, this map is the map of Beirut, and the red dots are showing the small custom-made power plants that will compensate the lack of electricity provided by the government. So we have a major problem of local combust combustion emissions that are increasing the levels of NO2 in the air. This is in the case of Beirut, but it is the same case in Syria and the same case in Iraq. So in countries where the situation is not really stable and the government or the government is not doing what it's supposed to do, we see much higher emissions of inefficient combustion. Whereas in places where we have uh, local deserts, we see major emissions from deserts. This is in terms of air. When we also look at water, we see that climate change affects water a lot. I want to give only a few examples. And the first example is the Euphorate River in Iraq. And you can see that this was, or this used to be, the Crescent Fertile Valley. Not anymore. There is so much drought and water scarcity in Iraq, and you see that the river is shrinking, and everything around the river is becoming desert, de desert arid. The problem is the water is misused, or it's taken up by, the, by Turkey and Iran before it reaches Iraq, and Iraq is suffering a lot from this. In some places in Iraq, we also see the drought covering lots of lakes. And that is also adding to the water scarcity. In Syria, it's the same thing. You see that the width of the river is shrinking. And with less water, we see high water pollution. And that's a major problem. Added to the scarcity of water, there is a major problem in soil degradation. Because when we don't have water, and the soil and the vegetation on the soil becomes too dry, and this will increase the chances of forest fires. And by losing trees from the, uh, from the land, we're going to expose the soil to wind and to mudslides. And that's a major problem of climate change. So losing vegetation, trees and shrubs, will expose the soil and will let the soil slide. And by sliding the soil, 
we are losing the possibility of replanting uh, all the greeneries that used to be there. Also, we have been really good in uh, polluting the soil, and this is also adding to the loss of fertility in the soil. So soil erosion uh, and degradation is extremely, it's extremely bad to, to, to the planet. If you, if you look here in the picture, eroding soils will create what we call dust bowls, meaning that no vegetations are there and any wind will pick up lots of soil and will move it from one place to another. This is a picture that was uh, taken in 1935 in the US and the bottom picture is the picture of ladies who used to wear masks when dust balls happen. We're doing the same now. I wanna just talk about the Iraqi case, and here you can see that in Iraq, suffering from nearly a decade of war and drought, a new dust bowl appears due to overgrazing and overplowing. Iraq is now losing irrigation, irrigate, irrigation water to its up, upstream riparian neighbors. The reduced river flow combined with the drying up of marshland, the deterioration of irrigation infrastructure. The fertile crescent, the cradle of civilization, may be turning into a dust bowl. I'm going to come back to this, especially the last sentence. So when we talk about air pollution, and then we talk about water pollution and water scarcity and soil erosion, of course, people are going to be affected. What do people need to do? Well, the UNEP executive director said, when the world is burning, we must all become firefighters. How do we do this? This is what I want to talk about in the next part of my presentation. How do people become firefighters? So starting with academia. Should academia be a closed environment? No. The universities play a major role in reaching out to communities. And I was learning from Nahed today that this institution started by engaging the community and inviting them to become part of this institution. And this is extremely important. Universities should also be reaching out to local governments and to the private sector and definitely all of these three stakeholders should also communicate with international organizations because without international treaties, we cannot really put a comprehensive approach. Examples of some bold movements that universities can do. The first and most open, uh, the, uh, the most important thing is to make our culture openly accessible. All knowledge that universities produce should become open access. And this is a culture that started a few years ago, and I think it's beautiful because knowledge should be commonly shared with everyone. Scholars should engage with citizens and local residents, of course, to learn and co-create solutions because we cannot be enclosed and pretending that we're not living in the same community as our community. Prevention is extremely important and being part of the global solution is also something that we have to do. Documenting and sharing. This is something that we're not used to do in universities a lot. And we believe that only scientific publications or academic publications are the ones that should be put out. Well, what I have learned in my career, and it's a long career of 20 years of scientific publications, what is mostly written, uh, read by people and interesting to people are not scientific publications. And what is read and accepted by politicians, now I know, 
is not scientific publications. I have put out over 150 publications, given recommendations to policymakers. They never read it. So it's extremely important to engage in different types and different forms of documentation and work on sharing this documentation with the wider community. I want to give an example of the importance and the force of open access data. And I want to show that in Ju June 2021, there was a special issue in Nature talking about how scientists across the globe teamed up together in order for them to find a cure for coronavirus. This was extremely interesting. The whole issue was about stories of, scientific, of the scientific community working together. I just want to quote the opening of this special issue, where it says, this special issue of nature shines a spotlight on collaborations in science today, particularly in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. It reveals that such a cooperation, although complex, is thriving in many ways. It is clearly essential, both to the progress of research and to the betterment of the society. Okay, so this is extremely important and it's a fact. We found the cure for coronavirus in a short, in a, in a, in a speedy way that has not happened before. Also, probably most of you know that, you know, technology has advanced a lot to put out lots of local cheap or low cost sensors that are able to measure air pollution, water pollution and alike, and things that we need to measure. And when people become able to help scientists in those measurements, we get a much finer spread or understanding of how the situation goes. So in the past, for example, on air pollution, we used to have monitoring stations that are super expensive and only two or three would be afford afforded in the city. Now with the low cost sensors, almost everyone can have one to measure air quality. And this is how we can spread knowledge and we can know in a fine way what are the levels in the different corners and in the different parts of the city. So this is, uh, I believe, the low cost technology will advance a lot in the future and will become knowledge and science become much more inclusive. I want to give two examples of how community raised, ra rose to the challenge and how they have taken part in the solution. This is creating the solutions. And one example is the Environment Academy, and I'll talk about Khadid Beirut in the second example. Both of these examples, although happening in Beirut, can be replicated everywhere. So for the Environment Academy, it emanated, it came out of need. Lebanon has been facing a solid waste management problem since 1970. We also have a loss, a huge loss of green spaces due to forest fires. And we also have a major problem with water due to drought and mismanagement of water. So what did we do? We asked the community to become the agents of change, to become the scientists and to take part of the solution. So that's why Environment Academy is a community-born initiative supported by experts. And I'll explain how. We put the community at the center. We brought in experts from academia and global experts, and we linked them together with the community. And we also brought public authorities. All of the entities that revolve around the community were helping the community to find solutions to their problems. Of course, we engaged the media, and that was a very important tool to bring out the good in everyone in the community, and that's documenting and sharing through media, and here it was the television that played a major role. 
And so we systematized this in a very, very clear way. We had a call for participation, teamed up the te you know, put the teams together with experts in order to develop their understanding of the problem, co-created the solutions and co-implemented what we decided to fix. And the most important thing, and I wanna emphasize on this, how universities are able to play a long-term uh, support for the community. And I wanna just differentiate this between, between the universities and NGOs. Usually non-governmental organizations are bound to work with grants, and once the grants are out, they stop working. The university, in the contrary, is a permanent entity that lives with the community and is able to always extend hand with the community. And that's why this long-term relationship, once established, it will uh, ensure its continuity. And so uh, what we did with a very, with a large number of volunteers and only very few people who, who were um, hired to run the Environment Academy, we actually were able to reach out to the community and work with them. I want to just say that all of these people who are experts globally have volunteered to help and mentor the community teams. Uh, uh, I, I was the director before I became the member, a member of the parliament. Now Sami is the director of the Environment Academy. The first year we helped 10 projects all across the nation and the second year, meaning this year, we're helping 12 projects, okay? Those projects vary. We don't choose the projects for the community. The community decides what projects they wanna work on. And these projects revolve around water, solid waste management, protecting uh, green spaces from forest fires, and, uh, and protecting the biodiversity. And I wanna run through several of the examples because they're extremely interesting. So this is Bir Asha. It's a village that is on top of Wadi and Nubin. It's a UNESCO site, beautiful site, that decided to work on their solid waste management, a committee from the community, along with uh, uh, the coordination with the ahead with the municipality, they decided to work on this. So they do the math, they do the layout of the design of the solution and all of that. And they also fundraise to get all the materials that they need. This is a major problem in one of the rivers where we have collection of plastic like you saw. Um, and the community is working on a solution to stop the plastic from coming. Uh, from continuing down the river so that people are able to swim like they used to do in the past. This is another village that decided to do solid waste management and you can see the maps and the discussions that are happening between the mentor and the local residents of the community. In this forest, that's a shuh, uh, fir forest, uh, it's extremely valuable forest that goes back 6,000 years. And uh, what the community has seen is that only the trees that are 30 years of age or older are surviving, no young shoots are surviving. So they were worried that this is going to extend the forest and this is when they decided the local community to step uh, in. And we teamed them up with two mentors from the diaspora and they are working on finding the, so the, you know, the problem and support, uh, suggesting solutions. Also, we are experiencing um, tree cutting, especially now with the economic collapse, people are referring back to tree cutting in order for them to prepare for the winter, but also local citizens are becoming the ones, the watchdog for others, and they are reporting uh, a lot of these violations to my office. In another community here, we have a group who want to turn this arid land into a forest. And in this community, the shrubs, 
uh, all the fuel of the forest fires have been cleaned up completely so that the forest can survive and you know s uh, prevent the fire from happening. Uh, uh, last, it's not the last one. There are two more I want to talk about, but this one in particular, if you can see, this village doesn't have water, doesn't have enough water. So what they did is they created a rain catchment uh, uh, holes and uh, they survive, all the plantations survive from these uh, rain catchment areas. So they are spread all over the place. And next to these rain catchments, you see lots of green spaces. So this is how the village survives, basically. Uh, in this village, we have uh, a huge tension in the village. And uh, it's so interesting for people who know politics in Lebanon. This is one of the leaders in the mountain area. And this is another leader. And those two people were killed fighting over to protect the two leaders. But yet, yet, uh, what happened is that the community teamed up because they wanted to find a solution for their water problem. So environment is able to bring people together because of need. And last but not least, this is a village really at the border of Lebanon and Palestine, and uh, they are suffering from uh, sewage water being exposed op in the open air and also threatening the uh, olive uh, tree scapes. And so local community, local young people decided to take action. All of these people and all of these examples are community members wanting to take action, we teamed up, we, we teamed them up with mentors, with experts, and together we find solutions. We rally together also to find funding and start implementing uh, the solutions. I would say that we are at the 70% success up until now, and we're continuing to work with them. I want to just read some of these testimonies that members of the communities have said. So 70% uh, of place-based community members report that they have joined EA, Environment Academy, because action in the areas they called home was their uprising against a failing government, and that, uh, and that if they didn't do something, nobody else would. Uh, Peter said, change in my village before change in my country. This was my personal motto. And Dahlia said, a community member from a part of Mount Lebanon tells how after the Beirut port explosion, she had no more trust in anything. It felt like there was nothing left, like my world was going dark. My little local initiative felt like the only thing I had control over. So I grasped onto it slowly. I started to feel like I could do something. Here, I had some control to create something positive. Speaking of the Beirut blast, I think this was very, very devastating to a lot of people in Lebanon. It's the most aggressive non-nuclear explosion, explosion of the century. Uh, we woke up the second day after the explosion looking around and just seeing debris. Um, it was very, very depressing. But at the same time, um, I want to tell you the story. It's emotional a little bit. So my friend came to me and she said, let's take a walk in the city. We started walking on broken glass. And then after walking for an hour, she looked at me and said, we must do something. We cannot let this uh, crumble under our feet. We have to step up. So we came back home and started calling our friends, our colleagues from the American University of Beirut and from the whole globe, and scholar activists this time. So before in Environment Academy, I showed you how members of the commu commu community stepped up. This time, they're professors at, at universities who decided to take action. And we like to call ourselves the scholar activist. So we said together on the same day, and we said we cannot watch the crumbling of our institutions, pretending that nothing is happening. So we could not go back to our university, close our doors, and continue our life. 
we stepped up and decided to create solutions today based on a trendis transdisciplinary, inclusive and sustainable approaches driven by the needs of the community to break the cycle of toxic practices. So it's another example of how scholars can become the agents of change in this case. And so we created what we call the Shake Up of Beirut or Khadid Beirut in Arabic. And so scholar activists from different disciplines and in one night we were able to gather more than 150 experts who decided to create a roadmap of how they want to work together and focus on the four main uh, areas, community health, environmental health, education, and small to medium enterprises. Those four areas did not come uh, by chance. We knew that the education system, especially the schools around the area, were going to be affected. The area where the blast happened housed too many businesses, small businesses, restaurants and pubs and small, uh, small shops. And at the same time, of course, health was affected by the blast and by the environmental uh, stresses that were going around. And so uh, we, in, in, one or in one month, we were like around 280 members, 110 inside Lebanon. We were six plus universities working together, almost 12 plus disciplines, and all the students also volunteered at the same time. And that's why I say we were almost 41 plus internship completed who uh, came together to help. So we decided to work with six public schools, scholars from different universities, 30 plus businesses, 12 municipalities, uh, 40 plus different organizations, UN, uh, syndicate of computer science, syndicates of owner of restaurants, cafes, nightclubs, and pastries, and the ministries of public health and the ministry of education. So again, we started on a grassroots initiative and we wanted to co-create solutions with the community. This was always our main uh, drive. And what we did, we broke the walls of the university to open it up to the local community. We wanted to know their needs. We wanted to bridge the gap of knowledge between us and them, together co-design and co-implement solutions and hopefully all of these people who come together to work with us will be the agents of change that we all want. And so this will be very important because scientifically speaking, it is important to situate the context because context matters a lot. It's a lifelong learning approach because none of us can claim that they are done with knowledge. And it's an action research and it's a, transform a transformational change. Uh, just a few examples, like I did in Environment Academy. So when Rebuild Together, we teamed up with 15 different organizations. We helped over 120 small businesses. And at the same time, we were given the uh, accreditation and an award from the AACSB. Uh, it's an award from an institution uh, for business schools. Um, we also did a webinar series for people who wanted to explore different approaches to do in business or different venues or actually different countries to export and promote their businesses. So we did that. And then we also uh, helped in mapping the ecosystem and creating the um, solutions that they need and help them fund some of the repairs. At the community health, it was interesting. It was during COVID. We created so many uh, small uh, community health hubs in different municipalities because we wanted to alleviate the burden on the, on the hospitals in Beirut. And uh, we also created a preventive uh, community health center in Carantina. At the environmental health, we also assessed the damages, the environmental damages, and also created a consortium of, um, of collaboration. What is very interesting is that at the education level, 
we created what we call community schools, whereby we didn't want the schools to be completely detached from their community. We helped them in food, stationery, clothing, health services, IT infrastructure, tutors, and gave support also to the teachers. Um, community school, it's a concept that is led by Dr. Rima Karami Akkari. She is now the chairperson of the education department at AUB. This is an extremely new way of looking at schools uh, in, in modern, uh, in modern uh, eras. And so uh, we create agents of change in the inside the school. We give them what they need, but we also assess the needs of the community so that they become really in, in complete harmony working together. I want to give an example of what the students uh, were able to do. So during COVID, uh, there was online learning. And what we realized is that 90% of the students, especially in public schools, do not have computers. And they were thinking about raising money to actually provide each and every student with computers. And then after studying this carefully, they decided not to, but in the contrary, create a nice place for them at the school so that they can come freely, them and their teachers, teachers to work. It's like a library concept, but it's for a computer lab. So here I am showing how the computer lab was before and how it turned out to be now for, for the students. And this is with the help of two organizations, one that designed and provided the architecture and the architecture and the implementation, and another NGO that defined, uh, provided the computers. And so if you look here, that's a before and after of another school. We did, we did six public schools the same way. And the students also wrote a guidebook of how they started thinking about this and how they came up with the concept at the end. Those are two examples of what we have been doing in terms of community being engaged in, you know, and taking part of the solution. So I want to I wanna end in a on a, in a question mark, because still, even with all these initiatives that are really uplifting and the so solidarity of the community and the scholars, colleagues of mine, was really helpful. But still, I mean, is this enough? We can look back into history because uh, VP, VP Sheikh loves history, so I thought I would add something historical about what I'm saying here. So throughout history, environmental damage has been one of the most important factors in civilization collapses. Environmental damage and climatic changes have driven crop failure, starvation, and desertification, contributing to the collapse of many civilizations, like the Peruvian Nata, Easter Island, North Greenland, the Anasazi, and the Roman Empire. Okay, with this note, so are there reasons to be optimistic? Can we at least delay the disaster if we cannot stop it? From my perspective, hope lies in grassroots movements, led by the people who live through the, this crisis day in and day out. They need change the most urgently. They are motivated to work towards new future and consist consistently create solutions through their knowledge of the place they belong to. Okay, sustainably integration must happen between local and international players, because even if the locals want to drive changes, they cannot alone. So they need to listen to what is happening on the ground. The current environmental challenges could be a space for change, imagination, and transformation, as it also could be the beginning of a longer downfall. Let us heed the warning signs of our polluted air and wildland fires to reimagine what life could look like after the storm. I'm sorry I'm not ending on a happy note, but I can say that in the long history of humankind and animal too, those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. Thank you. <laughs>